So you wanted me, so, so you want to start? We're at Azor 2017 with Carl Rock. Um, Carl, can you give us a little bit of your background, please? I'm a classical scholar, um, and uh, I've broadened the study of classics to be very interdisciplinary. I started out preparing to be a doctor, and then thought I would become a psychiatrist. And uh, in college, I had a philosophy teacher who told me that I, I wasn't interested in psychiatry, I was interested in the soul. And I thought that by studying sick souls in psychiatry, I'd learn something about human nature. And I realized he was right, and he said, if you want to study the soul, you have to study art uh, in the humanities. And those are the products of a healthy soul. And so I switched and became, I thought the most fundamental of the classics was Greek and Latin. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so I became a classicist. I was always interested, however, in the irrational sources of inspiration. Such as? I feel, I feel that art is something that pours through the artist as a tool. The artist doesn't know what the artist is doing, he or she is doing. Okay, He's in, in the possession of, of some other force that flows through. So more of a channeling rather than yes. a, a projected And, and um, this is clearly, personal, clearly the um, case. Socrates, um, in, <coughs> in describing how he tried to find someone wiser than himself, he went around uh, questioning all the people in various areas. And he, he talked to the greatest ones, the great politicians and so forth, he talked to the great uh, poets. And he said that anyone in the attendance could tell you better what a play meant than the playwright. The playwright knows that it, that, that's the play. You know, that's it. You don't understand it, do it again. I don't know what it means. It's, it's up to you to decide what it means. Okay. And, I mean, if you want it, if you ask the playwright, do you mean that it's better to do this and then that? The playwright says, I don't know. That's what Oedipus did. You figure it out. And so, but, so I became a classicist, um, and uh, I've always fallen under the influence of charismatic teachers. So when I got to uh, graduate school, I thought I was going to study poetry and drama, because that's what I was interested in. And I had a, a very distinguished professor the seminar I took, and in epigraphy, that's reading the inscription on stones. And uh, this is really, this is above me, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But somehow he thought I was good at it. And uh, you, had to, you had to study a stone for um, uh, your dissertation, for the, for the, not the dissertation, but turned out to be my dissertation, but for the seminar paper. And he said, here Rock, you study this stone, it's about, it's about drama. And so I, I worked with his material, um, but it's a very strange experience. It was wide, Widener Library, uh, 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 at the mezzanine as you go up to the second floor, there's a door and it enters into a two-room uh, suite, which was his office all by himself. And every afternoon I showed up in his office and I wrote my dissertation on the other side of the table. He worked at one side and I worked on the other. At the end of the day, he'd say, okay, Ruck, what have you found? And so it turned out it was a very important rock. It's a fragment of a lost work of Aristotle. <laughs> and it was immediately published. It's the most, it's the most technical uh, uh, credentials for being a classicist. And some people feel that I should have gone on and been respectable instead of going out to do what I've done. Yeah. So I've done that, but then I was always interested, as I said, he said, you can do this for your thesis, and then you can do the flimsy stuff later. <laughs> uh, he said, if you, if you go with the flimsy first uh, stuff first, you're never going to get your degree. And he was right. And so it was a, a spectacular dissertation, immediately published. And it's, uh, it's a little fragment of a lost work of Aristotle. But, but it's in the... What the, was the content of the, the, the kind of like foundation of the content of this lost? Aristotle, Aristotle uh, was a scholar and he, he had disciples who would gather material for him. For example, he wrote an essay on the constitution of various cities 
uh, the, the Constitution of Athens was his own work, but the others were by his students. And as everyone knows, he wrote a work on tragedy. He also wrote one on comedy. And in doing that, of course, he would want to gather all the evidence. And um, so he, or his student, gathered the evidence we have for what plays were produced in the festivals of Dionysus in, in the theater in the, in the fifth century. It tells you the date and uh, who, who uh, was the sponsor, um, what the plays were, and who won the contest. And uh, it was a document. But in the Hellenistic period, when Athens, uh, when the culture had shifted to the Hellenistic kingdoms like Alexandria and Pergamon, um, uh, Athens became an iconic city of Hellenic culture. And so they made a decree in, in Athens that they would uh, gather all the material, keep it in a, in, in a public library. And the document that did, uh, that recorded what was produced in the theater was inscribed on a building. On the so, building? Yes, and so it was... In stone, oh, hence, And course. so I had a piece of that building to study. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> so, um, but then I went on to be... I was always interested in Dionysus, the irrational source of, of, uh, of creativity. Dionysus, the god of intoxication, yes. god of wine. I've been able to show that wine is only is only the, the medium in which other psychoactive intoxicating substances uh, <laughs> were used. And um, periodically, I've done very technical things to prove that I'm not insane. So I've written to prove what sorry that I'm not insane. I've written. <laughs> I've written basic textbooks. I had to check that twice way. just because I liked it so much. I was wondering, did I just translate that in my own head? Sure. Uh, basic grammar books and things of that kind. But um, I've gone on to do a lot of things and I've broadened the study of classics so that it goes beyond uh, classical antiquity, it goes into the European tradition, okay. goes into prehistory. It's such I a studied, beautiful era. I mean, I, yeah. I also I kind of cover a kind of time. I've yeah, rock paintings, Paleolithic rock paintings, so, so it's become quite broad. And you had asked me about works of, in the Renaissance. Is that what you want me to talk about? Uh, well, actually, I wanted to ask you firstly uh, regarding um, my uh, friend, um, Josh, said you actually came up with a coined word, entheogen. Yes. And can you tell me what led you to that word? What, why were you looking into that? For example, entheogen, for example, I know, you know, uh, psychedelic um, almost has a connotation of something of the 60s. Uh, hallucinogens maybe yes. denote something that it's not real. And so me personally, amongst, you know, countless other people on the planet, have taken on your, you know, your terminology um, of entheo, which I believe is derived from the root of uh, God, no? yes. to become. Can you explain a little bit, please? We had just published uh, The Road to Eleusis. I, I worked with Albert Hoffman and uh, R. Gordon Wasson um, on a uh, ancient religious initiation. Wasson had uh, written a book on Soma, which is the psychoactive plant deity of the, uh -huh. of the Vedic tradition. It's the same deity that in the Avesta, which is the Iranian Persian the tradition. The Avesta, I don't know this. The Avesta is the Iranian or Persian version uh, equivalent of the Rig Veda. And there the, the deity is called Hauma. Hauma and Soma are the same word. The S and the H are interchangeable. So it's the same sacrament. Um, and Wasson had uh, noted that this deity, who's central to the religion and is an intoxicant and is a plant, um, there is no, it's not personified. We don't know whether it's male or female, but it, uh, the attributes of the plant are clearly preserved in, in traditional phrases. And he found it extraordinary for a plant that there is no description of its roots, its stem, its leaves, or its flower. Um, so it's an unusual plant in that way. And he, um, 
he thought it might be the Amanita muscaria, and he thought this because earlier than that he had worked with his wife Valentina Pavlovna. I don't know how long you want me to talk because I go on forever, but but uh, it's, it's a well-known story that Wasson, on his honeymoon with his wife Valentina, who was a Russian emigre, uh, they had been courting for five years because she was studying medicine in London, and her family didn't want her to marry until she got her degree. Um, and so they, it was a long courtship, and then they married. And on their honeymoon, she went, and they took a walk in the, in the forest, and she saw all these beautiful mushrooms growing, and he saw toadstools, only poisonous toadstools. Um, and she insisted on picking them and cooking them and eating them. And he was sure she was going to die. She didn't. He said it, in five years of courtship, it had never occurred to them to discuss something so fundamental as their attitude towards mushrooms, which is, of course, silly because you never, but it never occurred that they had such a fundamental different attitude. And, um, and so they wondered why it was that coming from different traditions, he was Anglo-Saxon and she was Russian, why uh, they had a different attitude. And um, they discovered that English has only four, room, four words for mushroom, and none of them are what it is. We, we have fungus, which is a metaphor. It's, it's Latin, first of all. And it, fungus is the same word as spongus in Latin. It's a sponge. So it's not what it is. It's a metaphor for it. Um, we have uh, champignon. Um, which is uh, French, and it means it grows in the field, which isn't true. Oh, really? uh, okay. We have uh, toadstool, which isn't a name, it's a metaphor. It means that the loathsome psychoactive toad is sitting on it as its stool. It's involved in the whole Celtic lore of fairies and beings that materialize the way them. Steel, yes. yes. And um, then we have mushroom. Um, and at the time, he didn't know this. I've just recently figured it out because it sounds ridiculous. Um, but mushroom is not its name either. First of all, it's well known that mushroom is an importation from the French, Mousseron. Um, and so it's not, it's not, a, if you use a foreign word, it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not really a name for, for the substance. But, but mushrooms would be native to, to England. The, the word is a, an importation from the French, word, yeah. but as a matter of fact, the French word can be traced back to, to late Latin musare, which means to moo, bellow, roar like a bull, and it goes back to Greek, muen, okay. which means moo, bellow. It's a metaphor. It's a it's a zoomorphism of of the plant as either a bull or a cow, which is very important in all of the folklore uh, that I've been able to uncover about it. So anyway, we have only four words. Some things are too sacred to name, like God, Yahweh, is not his name. It's the safe way to say his name. It's written with four consonants, the tetragrammaton, and you, and you must never pronounce it correctly. So Yahweh is the safe way to pronounce it, because if you pronounced it correctly, you would desecrate it and you would in effect control it if you name it you control it and so it, it would be a great sin so you must never name it um, so when you have something that doesn't have a name you realize that, that there's something sacred about it whereas russia has 40 more names for the mushroom they are not names either they're all metaphors but they love mushrooms and the anglo-saxons hate mushrooms and the, they wondered why it was that they had different attitude and they suspected it had something to do with a, a religious taboo on a sacred substance so it was with that in a knowledge um, that in the 50s early 50s they were made aware uh, of the fact that in the highlands of mexico oaxaca province Huatla de jimenez there were shamans that were ingesting mushrooms and inducing trance states 
and so he went uh, to Watla de Jimenez and discovered uh, first one shaman and then that shaman's mother-in-law, Maria Sedina. Did you meet Maria Sedina? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, he published, they were about, Wasson and Valentina were about to publish their big volume on what they had discovered about mushrooms in European folklore, uh, mushrooms, Russia, and history. And he published it at his own expense. He was a banker, and so it was an investment. Uh, the book sold for $500, I think, uh, or only 500 copies were, were made. Maybe it was less than 500. It now sells for thousands, except it's been pirated. You, you can download it on the web. But it was an investment. And so since it was an investment, he wanted to publicize it. So he published his experience with Maria Sabina and Life magazine in May of 1957. A classic uh, issue now, and that precipitated the psychedelic revolution. People didn't. Other was that the, the first time that the antigen word was actually printed? No, no, no. But no one knew that there were substances. Like, I mean, people knew, but common men didn't know it. It's been it's been a secret kept by the elite through the centuries. Um, William James, for example, in, in 1902, uh, spoke about uh, there being other dimensions of reality parted from this by the filmiest of barriers and he had experimented widely with all kinds of mind-altering substances so they were uh, but he was elite <laughs> uh, he was the grandson of, of uh, Longfellow the poet okay, uh, sorry. Longfellow the poet uh -huh. Uh, who was, uh, so anyway, the elite always have known, but the common men didn't. And with the publication of the Life magazine article, people said, oh, and they start going to Mexico, being initiated. Um, uh, Albert Hoffman had discovered LSD in 1940, actually 38. Well, so he just spearheaded the whole movement, yeah. didn't he? But um, nobody, he, he, he discovered it in 1938, but he didn't realize it was until 1943 when he, when he took it. And, uh, but no one paid the attention to it. But with the publication of the Life magazine article, suddenly everyone was aware of this. They said, I want to try that. And they became aware of LSD. Within 10 years, Life magazine published another lead article saying that LSD was a drug that had got, for a therapeutic use, that had gotten out of control, the abuse. And so that almost immediately after that, we had the Controlled Substance Act. So it was because they sus suspected that it, it was uh, the mushroom had a, a sacred function um, that he went to the Orient uh, after his wife died and investigated Soma. And when he published that, uh, people said, well, that's interesting. But if that's the case, there must be other indications of a psychoactive mushroom in other places where the Indo-Europeans uh, migrated. And because of that, he contacted me, and I became involved with him and Albert Hoffman, and we worked on the Eleusinian Mystery and published the Eleusinian uh, Mystery. The El Eleusinian. The name of the place. Eleusinian. The name of the place is Eleusis. It's the same word as Elysium, or as in the Champs Elysees, the place of arrival, uh, the blessed What's other it, world. It, um, I read in um, uh, one of my favorite entheogenic books, which is um, uh, by Jonathan Ott, and um, I. Th uh, I think if I remember correctly, he basically says that uh, the first um, uh, written illegalization of a sacred sacraments was, I think, in 369 AD when a Visigoth king ransacked an Eleusian mystery school um, and uh, basically decreed on penalty of death that nobody should take... They, they, they closed the pagan uh, temples. To call them pagan means that they're evil. A pagan just means it's what the Christians uh, uh, eventually thought of the, the previous religion. Pagan comes uh, from Paganus, which means the village. And when Where Europe, does pagan come from? The, the Latin word for village. It's the village religion. Oh, really? Is that and, the etymology of it? And, and it, it? Oh, I did not know. Because when, when the Europe was Christianized, yeah. of course, people didn't immediately change. And only where the, the government could control them. So the surrounding the areas city. would be but pagan. In the country, they just continue. Oh, I see how some, fascinating. Some, some places in Europe only officially converted in the 11th century. 
only for the sake of better commercial dealings with the rest of Europe. Wow. It's like it's like uh, signing on to the euro, <laughs> uh, but they didn't really believe it was worth anything. Uh, so um, we published this, and uh, at that time, uh, the 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 effect of the abuse of LSD and other psychoactive substances had produced what you were uh, describing, the whole cultural ambiance of the 60s and 70s. Um, hippie culture, uh, 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 anti-war demonstration. The, the problem is that what the entheogen does is allow you to realize that what people have told you is true may not be true. And this was particularly important because we were fighting a disastrous war with Vietnam and people were being sent to be killed because the government said it was something they had to do and they said, I don't know, it doesn't seem like I have to do that. Yeah. And so it was a great threat to the stability yeah, of the United threat. States. Still is. Yeah. Still is. It, it, the entheogen is a threat if it is... Uh, if it is prohibited by the culture. If it is endorsed by the culture, it reinforces the most basic structures of the culture. Yes. I'm not sure which way is right, because I don't like people being indoctrinated into a culture either, but where it functions as sanctioned by the, the culture, it makes the culture more co cohesive. And this is the whole point of, of uh, initiation rights amongst, amongst various peoples. So anyway, because of, of all of that, um, it seems incongruous to speak of what we had found at Eleusis, where a vision was induced by the drinking of a substance. And do you know what that substance would be? What's your take yeah. on what that substance would be in the Eleusis? Well, it's, um, as I said, people could think I'm crazy because... Um, a great number of people in various disciplines throughout the world understand what I'm talking about and think I'm right or somewhere right, but I'm also dealing with a very conservative profession and classicists. And classicists are very reluctant to think that the Greeks would have done anything like that, although they had a god of intoxication. Um, I, have, I have a colleague, uh, David Hillman, who wrote a book called The Chemical Muse, and it, uh, it was his dissertation. And I, I may be talking too much. No, 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 no. I just, I just want to, to, to hear what you thought. Okay. Well, I'm never going to get to the dish. <laughs> but anyway, anyway he, uh, he wrote this dissertation. Um, he had, uh, in addition to a PhD in classics, he had a, a master's in microbiology, so he could read medical uh, works in Greek and Latin. Okay, and what did he deserve? And so he collected what they knew about, about drugs. Uh -huh. And in it, there's a chapter on recreational drug use. Okay. Um, and so his thesis committee said, after much debate, um, we will accept this only if you delete chapter three. And he said, why? And they said because they wouldn't have done that sort of thing. And they, what was this? So what was chapter three? What recreational, the, recreational yes. drug use. Okay, but what do you think was the? Uh, well, was it just the, a kind of like an umbrella, or had they did they have a specific? Um, well, let me uh, finish what happened to him. So he deleted it, and uh, it, it was published by a, 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 a big uh, publisher reputable publisher uh -huh. and they, they his, his committee said you may have published it but we'll see to it that you never get a job they, we don't, they don't want that known and that's pretty much been the case he's been blacklisted so uh, well, as, as what drugs they were taking for, for example uh, uh, Hillman points out that uh, Nykander who is a Hellenistic poet speaks of people walking around the streets of Alexandria high on, on, on hemlock. Hemlock is the, is the drug that was used yeah, to kill, kill Socrates, but of course um, toxic substances in sub-lethal doses are intoxicating. And it's dangerous to do that, but it's dangerous for what people are doing today also. Um, but um, and so obviously all these people wandering the streets of Alexandria were not escapees from public execution. So very extreme intoxication was being used. So, um, 
So we wanted to isolate what we had, as, as I said, some people think what we're talking about is, is right, and some people think we're not. You asked me what drug was involved. It has to fit a very complex mythological scenario. It has to be related to grain. And it's too complicated for this interview for me to tell you all the, the parts of it. But, but substances are divided between wild substances and cultivated substances. And they're, they're emblematic of a whole class. And the grain is the most emblematic of the cultivated substances. And the wild mushroom is the most emblematic of the, of the wild. Um, you have, to, you have to make an accommodation with nature when you impose civilization upon it. So, for example, the original tradition is that the plowman, when he plows his plow through the first field, the plow was a stick like a penis stuck into the bulb of the earth and desecrating the mother by a sexual activity. Oh, really? And you, you have to pay for that. So the plowman was sacrificed. You have to give back to nature what you take from it. That, of course, becomes pacified. So every year there was an inaugural plowing of the first field, commemorating that uh, in a separate, uh, in a separate uh, field with an altar. And you didn't any longer sacrifice the plowman, but you sacrificed an animal in his name. But you had to give back, and, and the animal chose. It's all part of very complex symbolism. So you, you, you can't understand what we propose, except in terms of the whole, uh, this, whole, this whole pattern. But what we proposed was something that would mediate between the wild and the cultivated. And that was a fungus that grew on, on the cultivated grain, ergot. And uh, from ergot, you can extract LSD um, uh, or something close to LSD. And so our final uh, uh, view of it, we changed what Albert Hoffman originally uh, said, um, is that it's LSA, lysergic acid amide, which is the same thing as morning glory, liquid. And so it's highly psychoactive. It had to be something that was uh, interesting enough because there were no prohibitions against taking drugs. But to, to take the sacred drug profanely was punishable by death. And we know that people did it with, with friends at dinner parties and were prosecuted, put to death, their, their, their property wow. confiscated. Okay. And so that was our proposal. And we wanted to have a word which is kind of a, a, a you know ironic of our times when you know substances are uh, are taken quite frivolously yeah um, and there's very little ritual or ceremony or intent yes I don't know how much you want me to talk about this but um, as a matter of so so I won't go into Paul um, so if you could just finish speaking about what you were just saying um, and I've got a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, could, I can say, yes, um, Paul in the first Corinthian, in, in defining the Christian uh, mystery, uh, says that if you take the Eucharist and don't discern in it the presence of the deity, you destroy it. And that's the basic uh, definition of what we mean by an entheogen, something that is animate with the spirit of deity. And it has to be treated with reverence. If you don't treat it with reverence, you destroy it. You profane it. Um, as Maria Sabina said of the mushrooms, after the foreigners came and took it, the little children, the holy saints, because she personified them and she was a Christian, although this was pre-Christian religion, they have lost their voice. They're no good anymore. There's nothing to be done about it. So is that what you want? <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Well, I never got to tell you about tissues. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>